The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. January, I did a message called Feasting on the Will of God. And, you know, that's kind of like Jesus said, I have food that you know not of. My food's to do the will of him who sent me. And uh, I love Jeremiah when he says, your word was found and I did eat. And it was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. That's feasting, isn't it? So this is going to be part two. Today you're going to get meat, a little bit of meat. A little bit of vegetables and hopefully some dessert for the newbies, right? Newbies are going to go, I have no idea what he's talking about. Then you should do what I always said. When someone doesn't know what someone's talking about, it means find out, right? So, uh, I can remember the first year I was in ministry, they, I had people come up and say, nobody knows what you're talking about. You, gotta, you have to bring it down. And I, and I went home and God showed me uh, in a vision, a congregation, which at that time was very small, it's just like what we have today. And, and it was like a x-ray machine went by and he showed me they've got big, big heads and itsy bitsy spirits. You keep ministering to that spirit. Their heads are on overload, but their spirits need to grow, need to be fed. They need to feed instead of just read. And they need to learn how to drink instead of just think. Not that there's anything wrong with reading and thinking, but quite frankly, in the spirit realm, you want to enter into the author of that word, not just ink on a page, right? The letter produces death by itself, but the spirit gives life. We want to talk about the spirit. So we're going to get meat, vegetable, and dessert. Um, How many have ever, ever said privately or publicly, oh, I hope I don't miss the will of God. You ever said that? Well, I actually enjoy the people who actually are concerned. I say, you're not going to miss it. Anyone who said, I'm afraid I'm going to miss it, is actually applying themselves. There's people that could care less. I want to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, and how I want to do it. So if you've ever been concerned... Relax. The fact that you're concerned means that you are willing to apply yourself. And if you're willing to apply yourself, God knows you. And he will lead you and guide you. And he'll take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. That's worth writing down. God will take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. Sometimes, you know, you'd like to go around the mountain. That's the way you're used to learning. But God says there's a, there's a short point from A to B if you could surrender to me more fully and completely. Instead of water wearing down the rock, how about just offer your body a living sacrifice and open yourself up? Now, when we traveled, uh, uh, two things we noticed. uh, Back in the day, for about 12 years, Jennifer and I traveled church to church. And that was our best education, quite frankly, because you saw differences. Every church had a different little theme. But then the part that stood out was every church had some weaknesses from our gifting. And so I said, well, that's the part we need to emphasize. And one time uh, my spiritual father said, uh, I heard him say it, and then I did it, took it to the Lord myself. He says, if I had it to do all over again, now he was already in ministry probably 50 years at that time. If I had it to do over again, what would I do? What would I teach? You know, all of us, we should, if you had it to do over again, you know, hindsight's 2020, right? You, you, you learn from your mistakes, hopefully, and you learn what would I do different. And uh, when I answered that question, I said, I would teach on the will. I feel like it's just a neglected area, just like the emotions were a neglected area. And uh, I just said, why not? Why not teach on the will more effectively? And here's, here's what really precipitated us when we traveled. 
we were in churches of a thousand member churches and yet we would say simple things like you know like we, we we're singing choruses uh, uh bless the lord oh my soul soul is mind will and emotions that's it's got to be the whole ball of wax you go to any good baptist seminary and they'll teach you that repentance must be mental volitional the will it needs to be mental the will and the emotions there needs to be godly sorrow true repentance engages all three and when we stood in front of one congregation i was kind of shocked because it was a huge church and i says by the way where is your will 98 percent and you're watching by ustream we have far more watching by ustream and youtube than uh than are in this room uh, these people may have already been accustomed to the meat, but there's a lot of people out there that are going to go overboard just on the dessert. And one of the things that happened, and maybe you're doing it right now while you're watching, we says, point to your will. 98% of the congregation did this. That will hamstring you in your relationship and a walk in the will of God if that's what you believe. This is the place where you give consent. That's your thought life. Consent takes place here, but opening your heart requires the will, and that's down here. Down here is the door of the heart. Down here is where you need to pay attention to what, where the activity is. It's both. God, guard your heart and your mind right? And you want peace in both places. By the way, uh, you should have known this as a non-Christian, where your will is. When you would feel like you did something wrong, even as a non-Christian, you had a conscience, right? The conscience is in your spirit. It should have gone down here. It should have went, eh, uh, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Uh. And then it informs this. This is not left out of the equation, but down here, gut hunches. All of those statements are actually a form of locating. Why would we go to the church of Jesus and say, where's your will and have everybody go like this? That's a walk in the flesh. Your will is here. This is the door of the heart. This is where Jesus knocked. This is where he came in, whether you really believe it or not. You open the door and you yield it. You surrender. How many songs and choruses? I don't, you can go all the way back to the old uh, sawdust trail hymns. They all talk about surrender. It's not just the mind. It's the mind, the will, and the seat of the emotions. Now, if I told everyone that's watching now, point to your conscience, I sure hope you would point down here, not here. The conscience informs this. This is like the air traffic controller up there going, What's going on? What's going on in this physical body of mine? Oh, yuck, I don't feel good. Well, the feelings rise up to the emotional center in the brain. There's even some scientists calling it two brains, right? The second brain is in the gut. There's neurons there that, that are, function like a computer. And there's a computer up here. But this computer informs. Let me give you a quick example. This is my favorite one. Just to show you the emotional language is so significant. And for those watching, every thought in your head ever has a corresponding emotion. Thoughts and emotions are linked together. They are not separated unless there's a work of the Spirit of God to separate it. Every thought has a corresponding emotion. That will set you free in a whole lot of areas if you understood that and applied it. The will of God is like a jet stream. How many have ever watched the weather report and you see the jet stream? Now there can be various weather patterns on, this, on, the, on the ground, different parts of the country. But the jet stream to me is like that invisible will of God where there is a flow. And God says no matter who you are, what your giftings are, where he's placed you on planet earth, you can get into that flow and you can come out of that flow. The will of God is not just a plan, it's a river. It's an invisible spiritual river. And you can stay in it and you can jump out, right? 
So uh, here's something that, that we learned that in this yielding down here, surrendering, we have to actually teach people that this is where you yield and surrender. We would have them stand against the wall and say, fall backwards a little bit. And they would real you if you don't release it down here, you don't fall backwards. This gives consent. But this gives the yielding to permit yourself to do something that's quite unnatural. It's unnatural. Your flesh is going to want you not to fall. So you can actually feel that where you're yielding is down here. And almost everything that I learned in the, in the spirit in the early years that we're teaching, that we've written books on, that fortunately Jennifer documented, because it's subjective stuff, one of the first things that I learned was discernment, discerning the human spirit. And you've done it, but you've probably not developed it. You can tell when a person's will, which is the door of the heart, you can tell. Have you ever spoken or testified about Jesus to somebody and you felt like your words were going nowhere? Because that person did this while you were talking. And you, it's perceivable. A person who doesn't receive what you're saying, you can perceive it. Then you can get into all kinds of mental terms. Like, oh, I don't want to judge. I don't want to. But you're, actually, God gave you discernment so that you would judge righteously. I used to be able to, in my first church, as, even as a young pastor, I'd be preaching. I had this one lady that was very reactive in her will. She had some control issues, actually. But... I would say something, and, she, and I could feel her go, <clears throat> when you go, <clears throat> what does that usually mean? It e means you either got a bad witness on something, or you have a prejudice. Interesting. Interesting. What if you were a, just a, a good evangelical, and you didn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, and somebody spoke in tongues? You could either be, God? Is that you? And bear witness to the Spirit to whether there was an anointing on it or not? You know, wisdom searches out a matter. Or you could go, mm, that's, not, mm, that's not God because it doesn't fit my theology. Does that make sense? So what you call mm, a bad witness is really the voice of your conscience saying it doesn't line up with what I believe. A wise person, though, there are many evangelicals who later came into the fullness of the Spirit simply by saying, that's not what I was taught. God, is that you? Wisdom searches out the matter. So you drop the wall and you inquire of the Lord. That'll keep you safe. But see, that's, that's wisdom. Wisdom will search out the matter instead of just judging. One time I was praying uh, uh, in, in a meeting and... Uh, uh, I had me an evangelical pastor sitting in the front row and I'm praying for this person and I'm going, oh, I hope somebody catches him because down here I can bear witness when he is yielding. Does that make sense? If you can feel a person when you're talking or witnessing and they got a wall up, you can also feel when the wall is down and they're drinking in everything you're saying. Come on, raise your hand if you've ever had that happen. You know they're drinking in what you're saying. How many know, you also know when they're not listening at all, but they're smiling? That is spiritual discernment. Every one of you has it, but I want to see the, a church develop it further because everything that we've written in our books was out of the development of that further. Okay, so at least you have a point of reference. You know what I'm talking about. Have you ever had somebody compliment you and it felt creepy? Because you discerned the source, not just the content. I always use the example of that lady in my first church. She was trying to love me, but she just had a hard time with me. And she would say, I love you, Pastor. And it would feel like, oh, I wish you wouldn't say that. 
what means she was probably trying. And I'm a difficult person to love, so <laughs> she was trying. But, you know, you can say the right words and have a wrong spirit, can't you? And it is discernible. But if you're going to cultivate that and learn to flow in the jet stream of God's will, you're going to have to start with, you have to be the patient before you're the spiritual doctor. Before you are attuned to discerning someone else, you've got to let the word discern you. You're the patient before you're the doctor. And the more sensitive and the more open you are to the word of God, search me, O God, for Psalm uh, 39 says, search me for, O God, for anxious thoughts. There's your, every thought has a corresponding emotion. And hurtful choices. Search me, O God, for anxious. So that when he shows you something, if it's got anxiety on it or hurt, that's your responsibility to get cleansed of that. So that, matter of fact, that's how you know when you forgive somebody. When you forgive somebody, you can see the person without the hurt or the anxiety. Mental assent forgiving somebody doesn't work. The name of Jesus doesn't work in the flesh. So you can't just have a formula. You have to have an experience, a supernatural experience in the Lord to make it real. I, I just remember uh, receiving. We had to teach people to receive. Because they say, I'm listening. Listening is not the same as receiving. It's, it's are you open down here to being fed, not just information. And you can, you can receive a message. You know, as a matter of fact, there's some problems with receiving. If, uh, if you're a note taker and you're watching this for the first time and you're going, um, you know, people say, wow, Dennis, we saw you on Sid Roth. And I learned so much. Uh, that's 27 minutes, usually 17 minutes of teaching. And that's very minimal. You want to learn, you get to the online school and take the modules, which were systematically laid out in a progressive training of everything spiritual. That's the way to learn, and that's the way to understand even the terminology. But here's four, four things that we saw when we traveled that hindered people from receiving. Do you know that Jesus was the most anointed preacher that ever walked? I mean, it's kind of an understatement, but, huh? He was, was Jesus anointed? Yeah. yeah, okay. There were people that didn't receive him. So the problem was not in his anointing, it was their inability to receive. They had a prejudice, a preconceived notion of, oh, that's just Joseph's kid. Remember how he used to run around and play with our kid? Yeah, uh, whatever, you know. So we saw four problems. One, you don't receive the vessel. If you have prejudice toward a particular speaker, uh, you know, sometimes God will take that person and use them if you're open and if you're teachable. I can still remember, I can still remember Ben Kenchlow, who was a black uh, uh, co-host on, uh, uh, on the 700 Club with Pat Robertson. And he was a cool black panther and city dude. And the guy that led him to the Lord was a funny dressed white guy who his pants were too short, and his shoes were weird, and he dressed in a strange outfit, but that was the guy that got through to him. I mean, God's got a sense of humor. He'll use whoever he wants to use if you're open and available. And fortunately, he was open and available to hear the voice of God. Sometimes you won't accept the vessel that God's sending that will keep you from receiving. That's one way. There's three other ways. One and this is what we're doing here this morning. You don't know how to receive. You don't know how to receive because you don't know where it's at. You're busy going, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. You gotta go, uh-huh, 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 here. This is where you receive. When you got born again, this is what you received. You received him into your heart, cleansed you of your sin, and then he informed this, I know that I know. This knower here, 
All inner knowings, all spiritual knowings are seeing, hearing, or touching. But it's not flesh. It's supernatural seeing, supernatural hearing, supernatural feeling. Now, if I've got supernatural feelings, I'm going to have to get rid of the ugly feelings or I'll never know what's going on. Hmm? It'll cloud my, my air traffic controller up here, won't know what's going on. It'll be confused. All right, well, God's not the author of that. There's something, there's a mixed signal somewhere. Learn how to get into that flow of that jet stream. All right, so number one, we said you don't like the vessel. So you don't receive. Number two, you don't know how to receive. Number three, you don't know where you receive. This is where you really receive. This is what informs the mind. Your spirit, the door of the heart. The will is the door of the heart. And when you open it, it'll inform your mind. As a matter of fact, if you were spiritually walking, walking in the spirit, your conscience would rule your will. Some people's conscience needs more information, but at least if you would live and let your conscience rule your choices, if you get a, eh, that means no. <laughs> I mean, I didn't need a, eh, with my mother, all she'd have to do is give me a look, and I knew. You don't want to do that. God wants to guide you with his eye, not with a stick. But the eh is a warning. It's the voice of your spirit. Conscience is the voice of your spirit. Now, unfortunately, it's only as reliable as how much light you have. How much word do you have in you? So you can walk in the light that you have. You've got peace with God. If you start losing your peace, maybe God's saying you're not a bad person. He's just saying, I think you need to go deeper. Maybe you ought to, hmm? Maybe there's some word you don't know and you're not living in. Even though you know it in your head, you're not walking in it. And there should be a in there. And when God is speaking something to you through his word, it should go, it should be like an inner yes, like, wow. Now, when God deals with you, it's kind of, it's kind of both. It's like, ah, oh. <laughs> and then you remove the oh, and you move forward and upward in the things of God. Is this too internal for you? Uh -huh. I'm telling you, you don't receive the vessel. You don't know how to receive. You don't know where you receive. And the one that was probably the, the most uh, uh, disheartening was we saw people who, if you can't just go like this on me and I get better, I'm not going to try beyond that. The lack of effort. They very seldom received anything because of the lack of effort. They really won't apply themselves. I can remember having an altar call and feeling the presence of God. I had could feel an anointing flowing from me, and I could feel the openness of the individual that came for prayer, but they wanted only to receive from me when I said, now let the Jesus in you shut down right there. Close. Jesus in me, I came here for you to pray for me. See, I want someone to do it to me rather than me develop my relationship with God. They, she could have come into agreement. My anointing didn't work on a, someone that's got a wall up. And the only reason her wall was up was she wanted me to do the whole thing, which a lot of church people have been trained that way. Go to Joe Heavy Speaker, let him do his thing to you. Well, how did he get that? He developed that relationship with God. There's various giftings, of course, but all true fruitfulness comes from intimacy. That's your responsibility. That's not someone else's responsibility to get intimate with God and close to God so they can give you so that without any effort, you might receive. So what are the four elements? Lack of effort, lack of receiving. I got these in different order. Lack of receiving from the vessel. Don't know where you receive. And don't know how to receive. Uh, not, not knowing how to receive, I'd have people come forward 
and they were sincere. They wanted ministry. They'd come, but instead of opening up to receive, they were going, they were in give mode like they were going to try to get it. Well, if, you know, there's a time to give and there's a time to receive. You've got to be able to distinguish the difference. That is not a time for you to be pouring out if you're expecting someone to pray for you. That's like talking while you're eating, <laughs> you know. It's messy. It doesn't work well. It'll come out. <laughs> you won't digest anything. Well, God's taken us to the place now where... Primary story is Philippians 2, 12 and 13. If we could get a handle on this, we're going we're to enter into that jet stream, all of us, and we're going to deepen our relationship with God. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 can be very confusing if you don't differentiate your spiritual anatomy, your soulish and spiritual anatomy differentiate because you can quote scripture till the cows come home but very few can say here's how you apply that scripture all right so just look at this simple one here philippians 2 12 and 13 work out your own salvation with fear and trembling that's the fear of the lord and sensitivity awesomeness work out your salvation with an awesome respect for god for it is God who is at work in you. Oh, now here's where it gets confusing. Both to will and to do. Well, wait a minute. What's my part? And there's where we lose people. Your part to work out your salvation is you live by dying and you fight by yielding or vice versa, <laughs> right? You live by yielding, you fight by dying. And either way, it's a surrender. So if I was going to work out my salvation, that is not dead works, that is not trying, that is not working up a sweat. If I'm going to work out my salvation, it's going to be God who is at work in me to will and to do for his good pleasure. His will is his pleasure. Remember, I delight to do thy will, Jesus said. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. Jeremiah, his word was found and I did eat and it was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. All right, to discover that, then we'll take Galatians 2.20. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. So, now we have to know what you are we talking about. What I am I talking about. It is no longer I, the independent self, trying to live the Christian life. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So now it's the united I. Now it's me and Jesus. They that are joined to the Lord, are one spirit with him. This was so hard to get across when we traveled because people were trying to forgive and they would go to one of two extremes. They would give mental assent to forgiveness and still feel the pain, which is not forgiveness. Or they would say, okay, Jesus, you forgave on the cross, you do it. And I'll watch. I'll be an observer. What they fail to do is blend what the scripture says. It's no longer I who live, but joined to the Lord, the new creation me is Jesus and me doing the forgiveness. That's the new creation you. That's the real you. And when, when it's you and Jesus doing the forgiving, guess where it's coming from? It's coming from the heart. What does Matthew 18 say? Unless you forgive from the heart. We saw people suffer for years as a Christian trying to forgive. All that means is that you're trying to do in the flesh. You might be sincere, 
but you're sincerely wrong. You're trying to do what only God can do. Only God can forgive sin, but then the scripture says, you must forgive. So apparently it's got to be both of us. It's got to be the anointing of the new creation me that's doing the forgiving. Is this making sense yet? All right. And you, you need to know that your will is here. If you don't know where the will is, if you're going to be one of the 98% that points here, you're, how are you ever going to do it right from the heart? Now, we know whose will. Is it mine or his? Well, it's both. God is the forgiver. He lives in me. And when I yield to him, that new creation, me, lets Jesus go to it and through it and carry it away. Now, if Jesus talks about the will of God, I delight to do thy will. And his will is his pleasure. I think we've, we've confused I, oh, by the way, Google this and you'll learn almost nothing. I, I, I Googled duty or delight. And there's a lot of teaching out there, but it didn't, it didn't tell me how to do it. You know the difference between duty and delight. Delight thyself in the Lord. He gives you the desires of your heart. You can do religious duty and have it produce nothing. It's actually called dead works. Repent from dead works. So when you want it to have life and flow in that jet stream, it's got to be both of you. It's got to be a consciousness of we, not just me. It is no longer I who live has a suggestion that it is no longer I who forgive, but Christ in me who does the forgiving through me with my cooperation. It is no longer I who live. It is no longer I who love. We love because he what? First loved us. We can't, you can't even love God without his love. So we are fused together as a new creation. That's the real you and that's the way functioning from the will has to be. It can't be an intermittent thing in and out of the will of God. It needs to be a flow. It needs to be a life. It needs to be an awareness. If you can tell when someone's spirit is yielding, um, you, you, almost everyone in here anyway nodded their head when I said, have you ever said something and felt like it was going nowhere? Because the person had, what's the wall actually? It's the door of the heart. It's the will. But what did that mean? It means I'm not willing to take in what you're saying. And in some cases, if you see someone that really hurts you bad and they suddenly surprise you and walk into the room, the tendency in the flesh is to go, oh, you put up a wall. But unfortunately, when you do that, when you put up that wall, you close the door of your heart and you're on your own. If that person says something mean to you, this will not protect you. It'll go right through that because that's the devil's wall. That's flesh. Here's what God is going to cultivate in the days ahead. Meekness. Oh. What did Jesus say? Take my yoke. Learn from me. Yoke together with me. Now, you're not doing this by yourself. And Jesus said, I'm not doing it by myself. We're going to do this together. Take my yoke and learn from me for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. There's a flow. There's a rest for the people of God. Life becomes 90% attitude, 10% circumstances. And even science tells you, you have the capacity to make a mountain or a molehill out of any event. Science will tell you. Unsaved people know that. One person is traumatized over an incident that someone else blows off as irritating. You have that capacity to make a bigger little. God, on the other hand, in the supernatural realm, everything is little. What's it easier for you to say? Take up your bed and walk or your sins are forgiven? He didn't make the distinction of big and little like we do. 
we get traumatized in some cases by overthinking something that wasn't big to begin with. <laughs> you make it big. I, I like the illustration where they said, you know, the devil is a rat with a loudspeaker. <laughs> he magnifies fear to make you think he's powerful. But he can't take your authority unless you give it to him. I saw that if the will is his pleasure, according to the pleasure of his will, according to the good pleasure, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And for the joy that was set before him, he endured. I see in that will a pleasure. And when God was teaching me this as a young uh, well, I was pastoring by that time. I was a young pastor, a new pastor. And I was in my office praying, and the Lord showed me that my will was like a handlebar. When you take control, you grab it. You know, I'm doing this, and I'm going, moving and shaking. If, you, if I don't do it, it doesn't get done. Come on. That's when you grab the handlebar. God said, he said, if you would release that handlebar, I would wrap my strength around it. The more you release it, the more my strength will wrap around that bar. And then he turned the bar upside like this, and I, it was a scepter of authority. They that wait upon the Lord will renew. They will have an exchange of strength. But you're not going to get more strength until you let go. You can't white knuckle it and say, God, give me strength, give me strength. Oh, God, give me strength. God say, you let go. But he said that would be a scepter. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their, there'll be an exchange of strength. It'll be like the cable of his strength is wrapping around, but it's not instant. It requires yielding and staying yielded and learning the grace of yielding as a principle. And here, here's the thing, too, about the will. And be encouraged. If you've ever worried about missing the will, that's probably a good sign that you want it <laughs> compared to the people that are indifferent and they want their will. Meekness, when we said, take my yoke, learn from me, for I am meek. Meekness, to the degree you are walking in what we're talking about, to the degree that you're walking in meekness, is the degree to which you are given to God. To the degree you are not meek, you are given to self. But you use it as a formula. Hmm? Meekness is to not fight or resist the circumstances of life. Rather than reacting, you respond. And my spiritual father used to say, dead men don't kick. That's another illustration. You just, it's, do you rise up, the hair on the back of your neck, stand up like an animal when things don't go your way? That shows how much you are still given to self. And one of the things the Lord said for us men, maybe ladies too, but oh, I pick on the men on this one. Men, don't, don't, don't. Don't turn it off now. Listen to this. If you think you walk in the Spirit, do you drive in the Spirit? Just wanted them to think about that for a little while. Oh, I walk in the Spirit. I just don't drive in the Spirit very well. Huh? If you lose your peace driving, it's still you. The difference is you're in a vehicle. But it shows your... your, your it reveals a whole lot. This I'm stealing from Jennifer because this was, the, this was the sermon she gave to me when she didn't like my driving. Now, I had to stay open because I started to put the wall up when Jennifer said, Honey, I was thinking. Put the wall up. Oh, no. I know something's coming after she was thinking and it's aimed at me. Like, oh, okay, let it go, let it, let it go, here it comes. She goes, I was thinking, 
the road is a microcosm of the kingdom. Like, uh-oh, I know what topic she's on now. <laughs> and it's God's road, and it's God's people. And he places those people exactly where he wants them. All right, I repent, I repent. I got to drive in the spirit now, not just walk in the spirit. You have to maintain that same flow, really. There's something malevolent about being in a car that's <laughs> that frees you from being a person. And those objects are no longer people. Because if you were walking, you wouldn't treat them that way. Isn't that something? Because you're encapsulated, the real you comes out. You think it's hidden from sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom you must give an account. So my challenge this morning, if you get nothing else out of this message, the icing is on the cake is drive in the spirit. Don't just walk in the spirit and see how much meekness develops. Meekness is how much you are given to God. Lack of meekness is how much you're still given to self and having self be the boss. All right, it's time to resign from being general manager of the universe. I resigned, but I told Jennifer I campaign every now and then. But I did resign from being general manager of the universe. This is the way you should pray too. All right, are you getting anything out of this? Because I haven't even begun to touch the topic of the will. But it's, you've got to know there's hope. Uh, one of the scriptures that always helped was John 7, 17. If anyone, you're, you're an anyone, I'm an anyone. If anyone wills to do his will, that's all of us, right? We're all willing to do his will. Then you will know concerning the teaching whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority. If anyone is willing to know, you'll know. If you want his will, you'll know if it's his will or not. It's the ones that go, la, 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 <laughs> la. You know, I, I don't want to know. You're, then you, you, you're left to yourself. But freedom, Romans 8, 2, for the law of the spirit of life and Messiah Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Those that live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. The most important thing to understand, and it was even in, in the Old Testament, it's God who is at work in you to will and to f work for His good pleasure. Enter into that pleasure. It's not drudging duty. You can enter into the pleasure because then you take His yoke from you and you find rest for your soul, not frustration. You do not find frustration doing the will of God. You find frustration to the degree that you're resisting the will of God. And I saw it in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel, where he said, the day's going to come. And that's now, New Testament time. The day's going to come when I will write it, my law on the tablet of your heart, and here's the key word. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. It is God who is at work to will and to do. I will cause them to walk. So, you know, you're really without excuse because the grace of God and the divine enablement to walk in his plan is in you. It's just a question to what degree do you argue with it. And you walking in the light as he is in the light, but it doesn't mean you don't need more light. You want to walk more effectively in the spirit, then drive more effectively in the spirit, then you need to ask God, show me where I need the light. Because to the best of my ability, I'm walking in the light that I have, but there's still some obvious reactions. 
By the way, if you have any pet peeves or uh, soulish reactions that far exceed the stimulation, <laughs> I would say, like, there would be marital problems if the, if, uh, the husband comes home and she gives him uh, uh, the chicken that he likes, but he just was, he had a bad day at work and he goes, Chicken! I'm sick of chicken! I'm tired of chicken! I don't ever want to see another chicken again! Never, always, those words are key for a manifestation that something serious is wrong on the inside and the reaction far outweighs the stimulation. She didn't really do anything wrong except give you chicken. That's like coming home and kicking the dog because of what your boss did at work. It's, it's, a, it's an outward expression of an unresolved inner conflict and it shows you how much you're still given over to self. That's not meekness, by the way. Meekness is not as moved by circumstances. And the funny thing is, is if, as you learn to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh, and by the way, when it comes to the will of God, there's either the law of life or the law of sin and death. Your walk in life will always be based on a law. I don't know why, but some people think, I've got a free will, that means I'm free to do whatever. No, you're free to choose which law you want to live under. But you will, you will be ruled. One will be your master. It's either going to be the king of kings or your own selfish nature. King's self. See, king of kings, king's self. There's no Switzerland. You know, World War II, Switzerland remained neutral. There's no neutral. You're in one law or the other law. Choose which, where you want to live. God is basically saying, but I will put my spirit in you in Ezekiel. Isn't that a beautiful promise? I will put my spirit in you so that you will be without excuse. No, I will put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes. I will put my law on their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's also interesting in Jeremiah 31 because what he's saying is it's good to memorize the word. It's good to know the word in your head, but he's going to write it on the tablet of your heart. It's going to be far more functional. If it's not written on the tablet of the heart, you don't own it. How do I know if I own it? It'll be easier to do than not to do because God will cause you to walk. It is God who is at work to will and to perform. I'm believing more and more we are without excuse. We have the equipment and God's saying, and sometimes we beat ourselves for our ability when God's saying, I want your availability, not your ability. Your availability, then it becomes His ability that flows through you. For it is God who is working in you and through you. Where's your will? Quick, point to your will. All right. Does this work if you're in a hostile situation and you go like this? Oh, there's so-and-so. Does that work? No. You just, you just put a crimp in the hose of having God involved in the scenario. You're on your own. You're functioning as an independent self. And apart from Him, you can do nothing. So you say, what do, I remember when uh, Jennifer always liked that story. Sid Roth did it on one of the programs of when I worked in a halfway house with guys that were let out of prison. And then one guy pulled a knife, didn't take his medication, pulled a knife, and I'm standing by the exit, the only exit that was available uh, from that proximity. And peace flooded me. Now, normally I'd say, get out of the way. Protocols would say, call the police. But instead, peace increased while he was getting violent. So you know what I did? I trusted the peace of God more than my understanding. And I stayed there. And I found out that that peace can crush the enemy beneath your feet. The next thing you know, and it seemed like a long time, but it was a matter of probably a half a minute, he started shaking, dropped the knife, dropped to his knees, cried, and they gave him his medication. Peace does more than be passive. Peace will guard your heart and your mind, and peace will crush the enemy beneath your feet. 
we have failed to see the militancy of the kingdom message, the gospel of the kingdom, as it pertains to peace. Peace is not passive. Why did God choose that phrase in the scriptures? And the God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. Why didn't he say the, the warrior God will crush Satan beneath? He said the God of peace will crush Satan because the peace will guard your heart and your mind in a defensive mode, but will also be that scepter of authority to advance. And it's about advancement. It's about moving forward and upward in the kingdom of God, victory to victory, faith to faith. Well, I didn't cover any of the stuff I wanted to cover. Um, <laughs> but we'll maybe do that, maybe do that next week. Because every three years, I like to get a good message on the will in there. Because when we traveled, we saw that was one of the weakest areas of understanding, next to understanding the emotions, which many leaders in the 70s taught their congregations, ignore feelings. And that's only a half-truth. You can't live by carnal feelings. But there's supernatural feelings called the fruit of the Spirit. There are the God emotions that God created you to enjoy. He wanted you to feel joy. He wanted you to feel the love and the affection. He wanted you to feel the compassion. The, even the, the healing gifts moved on the compassion. Jesus was moved by compassion and healed the sick. You can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, you can't live by carnal feelings, but you better learn to know how to hand, get those emotions under the lordship of Jesus or you're just an accident going somewhere to happen. You need to understand the mind, the will, and the emotions. And most Christians have spent most of the time with the head. And I'm going to close with this and go back to it being the young pastor and the vision God gave me of that x-ray. He said, what you have in the church, and I'm a young pastor, and there was people in there that were schooled in the word many, many, many decades longer than I had been at the time. But God said, here's the fact. Big, big heads, but almost atrophied spirits. And in that first year and a half, I saw 400 people get filled with the Holy Spirit. 400 people that were knowledgeable with the Word of God, but missing experience in the Spirit. Is that possible? Of course it is. Let's stand to our feet and pray for those watching. Father, we pray right now. Many in this room here, this is, this is uh, not new. But God is saying, I'm going to take the things you know and move deeper in the days ahead. I'm going to take things you think you know and shine a light upon them and deepen it so that it can be not known in the mind but written on the tablet of the heart. This is the day of exchange, supernatural transformation. This is the day when the glory of God is going to rest upon people and transformation is going to be the key word. God encounter is going to be mandatory in our private time as well as our public time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.